just going to share my screen. So it's a huge welcome to everyone from across the world who is able to join us today. Uh, I'm speaking to you from an extremely warm East London. Um, and welcome to the online research forum at the Courtauld Institute of Art for this two-day conference, Art History in Climate Change. I'm just going to start by saying a few, <clears throat> excuse me, introductory words, and then I'll move on to uh, introduce the conference more broadly. The variable appearance of street murals on the boarded up shop fronts of Soho, Lower Manhattan, during the recent civil unrest in New York City, following the killing of George Floyd, raises questions about the differing efficacy of art and its institutions to represent and effect social change in our present moment. Whilst many boutiques in Soho covered their windows in hoardings at the onset of the COVID-19 lockdown in New York, many more wooden barriers were erected once people had taken to the streets in protest against the systematic murder of black lives. The tokenism of many upmarket stores subsequently commissioning artists to decorate their hoardings with the imagery of civil rights as in the depiction of Martin Luther King on the Hugo Boss store that I'm showing you here, is in marked contrast to the impromptu appearance of artists on the gentrified streets of Soho, painting murals in defiance of shelter-in-place orders, as documented by the Soho Social Impact Group, and I'm just showing you here one of their recent Instagram posts um, documenting some of this impromptu artistic production. One gesture works in, in defense of consumption, guarding private property with a flimsy carapace that represents the aestheticization of political activism into a bland liberalism. The other, shows the possibility of the reclamation of civic space through artistic seizure of representation in a city, indeed a world, in which the flows of capital have been dammed up significantly due to COVID-19. The renewed but hardly new injunction to question the very foundations of our artistic and cultural institutions in the light of racism and systemic inequality goes far beyond the publication of any diversity statement and pertains to the roles of art and art history in the climate crisis. It is one of the great joys of art history that its tools and insights can be mobilized to interpret the sensory, visual and aesthetic world around us and further that we can be empowered to take a huge range of objects of study. The current debates around decolonization of the discipline involve not merely expansion, but the questioning in the heart and in the head of why this has taken so long to come about. Indeed, if our, if our historical understandings of representation have suppressed alternative patterns of knowledge. Many of the papers that follow will address these issues. We shall consider the role representation plays in our understanding of climate and ask why some images of climate activism and environmental disaster might appear and become more alluring, effective and widespread than others. We'll also explore the particular dialectical potentials of art in the effort to avert catastrophic levels of warming. 
papers will address the work of artists based in Europe, North America, Australia, Africa, and Southeast Asia, and consider the methodological implications of both artists and art historians in global warming. This conference was originally to take place in person at the Courtauld Institute of Art. And one of the, uh, one of the consequences of moving everything online is that we have had to have a dramatically smaller event than we were looking to have otherwise. So I want at this point to say thanks to all those who submitted papers for this conference. And as you all, as many of you know, um, uh, if we had been working in person, we would have um, had the time and the resource to bring many more people to speak. I'd also like to thank Alex Bovey, the head of research at the Courtauld for her uh, enduring support for this whole process. And um, also the team in the research forum, particularly uh, Fern Inch, Acacia Finbo and Grace Williams for everything they do and everything they've done across this year to, uh, to be such wonderful colleagues at the Courtauld. Uh, I also want to thank the Association for Art History, who very generously provided um, extra, extra financial support for this project. And also our BSL interpreters, uh, Dan and Anna, who will be with us throughout the day. And finally, of course, I'd like to thank all our speakers for their efforts to prepare their work for all of us during this pandemic and all of you for coming to hear, uh, hear, hear the proceedings. Um, so how we're going to run this is we're going to have um, four panels today and the papers will be divided into two panel sessions. Uh, two paper sessions, excuse me. Um, and these will run for 55 minutes each. Um, there will be regular breaks and um, a longer 35 minute break around three o'clock. Um, we're aiming for all speakers to deliver their presentations live. Um, and indeed we have people patching in from various corners of, of the world. <laughs> um, but we've made provisions to uh, ensure that we can go ahead if uh, the vagaries of internet uh, uh, prove particularly challenging. Um, so thank you all very much for coming. I'm going to um, end my share now and I'm going to invite our first speaker, Preeti Kathuria, to share her screen, and then I will introduce our first panel. So, Preeti Kathuria comes to us from Bazant Valley School in New Delhi. Preeti is an educator and researcher and specializes in contemporary art. She holds two postgraduate degrees in history of art from the National Museum Institute in New Delhi and in curating contemporary art from the Royal College of Art, London. She has worked as assistant editor of contemporary art with the Lalit Kala Academy, the National Academy of Art in Delhi, in New Delhi. She has been writing on contemporary art for various journals and magazines. Besides critical writing and editorial work, she has taught visual art at several universities and colleges in India. Currently, she is a visual art educator at the Vazant Valley School in New Delhi. So Preeti, over to you. Um, thank you very much, Theo. Thanks a lot um, for this lovely introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm humbled and pleased to be a part of this forum. 
um, I think Theo has given us a wonderful introduction to start this conference. Um, my research is based on the activism and response of contemporary artists on the rural distress in India. I'd like to begin my presentation with one of the most iconic works of the 20th century. I'm sure we all recognize this work. Picasso's Gurnika, which is essentially a war painting depicting the aftermath of the Spanish Civil War. The painting drew a lot of attention and the lesser known fact is that it helped in funding the war relief through a touring exhibition. I'll move to my next slide. Again, I'm sure this is very familiar. The artist activist group, Gorilla Girls, who produced art with a singular mandate to fight sexism and racism within the art community. With these two artworks, with these two artists, I wish to set the premise of my research. Art offers an infinite anthology on issues of significance. It has a social function to fulfill and artists have recognized and responded to the numerous irreconcilable problems of our times. I would like to show how contemporary art practices in India have served as a catalyst for social immediacy and knowledge dissemination. Indian agriculture is heavily dependent on monsoon, on rain, and the unforeseen vagaries of nature make the farmers extremely vulnerable to death traps, eventually leading to suicides. And the figures, the factual figures are absolutely alarming. Droughts, floods, all add up to rural distress. Debt traps, lack of institutional credit, create a vicious cycle of increasing poverty. Then there is land fragmentation, rising costs, and highly exploitative intermediaries. Climate crisis, therefore, is a major contributor to rural suffering. Numerous contemporary artists are getting extremely uncomfortable with this situation. Through their artistic practice, they recognize and reflect upon this pernicious rural situation. The first artist that I'm going to talk about today is Aditi Bhattad. She's a farmer's daughter hailing from a village in Madhya Pradesh. This is a performance by Aditi titled, Are You Nero's Guests? The title is suggestive of Nero, the ancient Roman empire, the ancient Roman emperor who is believed to host lavish parties in his gardens. And he used to burn down his slaves, his prisoners, alive in order to illuminate the party. The title therefore suggests that Nero's cruelty and the callous neglect and attitude of the guests. Through this performance, Aditi wishes to confront people with the genocide of farmers taking place and the indifference of the urban society. As you all see, there is a number that is sunburnt on her back. When she sat there during the performance, this number was reflecting on her back, which is actually the official number of farmer suicides in India from 1995 to 2015. Aditi sat there and distributed postcards and indigenous seeds embedded in it. And 
the postcards carried names of farmers who committed suicides in the Varada district of Maharashtra. The other artist that I'm going to talk about is Shweta Bhattad. She built up a beautiful community art project that was titled, I Have a Dream. It was a global farming initiative with an aim to draw attention to farming practices. It was a collaboration between artists and farmers to sow fields and spelling out the word, I have a dream in their native language. It started in 2014 from Vancouver. Artists from around 27 countries participated in this project and created farm art in their fields and balconies and gardens. Shweta used art to empower communities through farming. The slide that you're seeing, this was done in Rajasthan in India. In continuation to the previous project, Shweta did a crop artwork in 2016. Spread over 7,200 square feet of land, Chindwara, Madhya Pradesh. This project was created over a period of three months. The artwork carried a message for the Prime Minister to encourage the youth to become farmers. Dear Prime Minister, please grow in India. A campaign that the PM launched called Make in India, in sync with that, Shweta wanted one more campaign. The two artists that I have just spoken about are actually two sisters, Shweta and Aditi. They run another project together, which is called the Gram Art Project. It is a collective of artists, farmers who come together in a village and are trying to make it sustainable to live in a village both socially and ecologically. They conduct performances, exhibitions, residencies, community workshops, etc., to challenge the social milieu of the village through art and culture. One of the projects done by uh, Gram Art was in 2019. They hosted an evening of celebration in Delhi. It was titled Climatical or Political. It was an evening of performances, artworks and dinner. The aim was to make the urban consumer aware about food security and increase the public debate on agricultural issues. Using their farm produce, they hosted an evening to serve food made from both successful and failed harvest edible and non-edible artworks and performances. It was all aimed at making the guests feel the burden of hunger. The artworks that were showcased were all made during the residencies hosted by the Gram Art Project. At the end of the three hour performance, they raised a bill for the audience, which you can see on your screen right now. And the bill was very interesting. It said, thank you for joining us for the celebrations. During these three hours, the society has incurred a cost of, and it lists out some very relevant things. Lives of five farmers, livelihoods of 250 farmers, a loss of agricultural land, and so forth. So the idea of the project was to raise awareness. The idea was to collaborate, communicate, and question the health of the agrarian sector. The other artist I'm going to talk about today is Kota Nilima. She's a researcher, author, political commentator. Her work focuses on women farmers and farmer suicides. Her solo exhibition, The Nature of Things, Death and Dualism in Indian Villages, was an effort to bring the rural distress to the fore and assist the families of farmers who 
who committed suicide through the sale proceeds of the artwork. Her paintings and photographs are inspired by rural life, landscape, and the deep crisis in the Indian villages. Also being an author, she writes extensively on rural distress. One of her books, Shoes of the Dead, is a realistic narration of a farmer's despair and eventual collapse. The book would soon be made into a film. Another extremely relevant artist duo that I wish to talk about is Tugral and Taura. They work across a range of media, including painting, sculpture, installation, interactive games, performance, and design. Healing from Punjab, the duo attempted to probe the agrarian crisis through two exhibitions shown last year. Red Circuses and I was the title of one of them and the other exhibition was titled Farmer is a Wrestler. As you can see in this image where he has created a game of playing cards and the farmer is shown wrestling both as a sport and in real life. The metaphor of a wrestler is employed to examine the ongoing struggle of the farmers. The battle of survival against so many odds. The viewer confronts these exhibitions and sees numerous distress equations designed by the artist in pursuit of empathy and social knowledge. Distress is shown through mathematical symbols. It reflects the complicated crisis that seems very difficult to resolve. One of the most powerful works was Surjit Singh. If you look at this slide, there is a larger artwork in the center. That is the film on Surjit Singh. It's a 27 minute video loop, which is surrounded by smaller artworks, which are titled Aftermath. They are put together in a single room and there is a bench for the viewer to sit and absorb the reality. Surjit Singh is a 50 year old man who has been reporting farmer suicides for over 130 villages in a district of Punjab. Over a span of 10 years, he met 2000 families of the deceased farmers to help them fill out the application form of their demise. And aftermath, as you see on your screens right now, these are 30 A4 size ink papers which surround the Surjit Singh video. These pages carry reports on agrarian crisis, including the Swaminathan Commission report, which was actually a report that was made by the government to serve and save the farmers. It was in 2004 that M.S. Swaminathan was, the, was made the chairman of the National Commission on Farmers. So what we see is the report papers seem to be blotted with black ink. But in reality, it is not ink. It is the residue of a pesticide spray machine. Every 30 minutes, Three seconds of pesticide spray is done. This was a performative piece. Referring to 30 minutes as the average time for one farmer suicide in the country. Extremely relevant and impactful works of Tugral and Tagra. And even more profound is the idea behind this activism. Quoting Tugral and Katagra, they say, we don't expect to solve these issues but we try to deliver knowledge and hope to raise public awareness through an empathetic approach. To conclude my presentation, I'd like to say that art might not have a solution for these complex problems, but it certainly provides a voice, a platform to the repressed, a discourse 
to spread awareness and a very critical perspective to engage, empathize, and act. I'd also like to add a quote by Stephen Pressfield. The warrior and the artist live by the same code of necessity, which dictates that the battle must be fought anew every day. So just going back to where I started, Gurnika, the battle is being fought and here the frontline warriors are the contemporary artists who through modalities of collaboration, communication, they are making an indelible mark in reconfiguring this war. Thank you very much. A writer, activist and student at the University of Edinburgh in the Department of Art History. Her dissertation explores queer theories impacts on art spaces in the Anthropocene. She is a committee member of her university's Amnesty International Society, where she has spoken on ethical practice in activism and journalism. And photojournalism, excuse me, and a founding member of the Rattlecap, a student newspaper making radical writing accessible and her paper for the first half of what I think should be a very interesting panel indeed is titled Defining the Body, Climate Art and Queer Ecology. Over to you Lucy. Thanks Theo um, and thank you so much to the organisers of this event and our interpreters and everyone for coming even in such strange times. As Theo mentioned, I've been an activist for longer than I've been an art history student. And I'm going to be talking about activist art, specifically through the lens of a recent Oliver Eliasson exhibition and the controversy that surrounded it. Art can provide an exciting and diverse vehicle for activism, but it also brings challenges with regards to ethics and accessibility. This presentation concerns climate art that only interacts with a limited definition of the human body. In this case, it's that which renders itself physically inaccessible for wheelchair users. The deeper implications of this problem will be explored through queer ecology, an outpost of queer theory centered on environmentalism to call for a destabilizing of a so-called nature and natural body that artworks such as these risk advocating for, and some possible solutions to this problem. I want to begin with an introduction to In Real Life, which was a survey of Oliver Eliasson's work exhibited at the Tate Modern in London in 2019. Oliver Eliasson is a Danish Icelandic artist and a large amount of his work deals with and interacts with the climate crisis. His works seek to engage the viewer with their environment on a personal level and does so by bringing phenomena so large as melting ice caps and changing landscapes to a thinkable, tangible level. In Real Life consists of 30 plus artworks, many of which transport, transform spaces or fill entire rooms with immersive experiences. Moss Wall is a living wall of lichen to be touched. Uh, looking through this untitled orb reveals the distorted faces of other gallery viewers. And How Do We Live Together is a mirrored ceiling connecting an arc that can be sat on, laid beneath or stepped over. The viewers encouraged to interact both with the artworks and with each other. Eliasson has previously referred to his viewers as co-producers highlighting the extent to which his work's meaning rely on their participation. The climate conscious agenda of this exhibition is pushed through both immersive artwork and combined with real world action. The final room for the exhibition called Expanded Studio includes real world ways to tackle climate change, including Eliasson's own solar power initiative and the ways his studio are making moves to combat climate change as well as further opportunities for audience interaction. The climate crisis is an issue that will necessarily affect everyone. 
and art that seeks to combat it bears a certain responsibility to activate everyone, or at least as many people as possible, as combating it will be a global effort. There are methods that could be explored to widen an audience, and Eliasson attempts a few. The use of sense perception, a key part of his entire body of work, removes any potentially elitist barrier that might require a prior background or education to understand a piece of art. No prior knowledge is required here, only the viewer's own body as they navigate the gallery space. To quote from some of his writing that reflects this, one of the great challenges today is that we often feel untouched by the problems of others and by global issues like climate change, even when we could easily do something to help. This is where art can make a difference. Art does not show people what to do, yet engaging with a good work of art can connect you to your senses, body and mind. It can make the world felt. In real life as a body of work seems to be the perfect example of wider viewership. It distills the artwork into multi-sense perception, giving climate art a platform that can be accessed by everyone. The works aren't reliant on an understanding of science or theory, but on base level human perception. In theory, this is highly effective activism and one that is taking a step towards a universally accessible viewership. Unfortunately, this perceived universality was not for everyone. This is your spiral view and it was in the penultimate room of the exhibition. The work is an enormous metal spiral and it's entered by steps up to a platform. Once inside, the viewer experiences a kaleidoscope of reflected light and metal in a complete transformation of the space around them. This piece was made in 2002, but has been exhibited many times since. In the past, it's been used to a, a specific end. Previously, it's been placed at the entrances to exhibitions where it transports the viewer through this kaleidoscopic effect into the constructed and immersive spaces of his exhibitions, thus functioning as a bridge both physically and metaphorically. Within In Real Life, after passing through your spiral view, the viewer reaches the final room of the exhibition, Expanded Studio, which includes the actions for the real world. Ideas for real change, in real life, with the artwork representing the move from gallery space to world of activism. However, your spiral view became the centre of controversy in April, when journalist Kiara O'Connor visited the exhibition and, as a wheelchair user, requested ramp access to the work. She was denied access to a ramp and later documented her experience on Twitter. Eliasson personally responded noting that he was in discussions with the tape about making this work accessible while still acknowledging its original shape. However, ultimately it was decided that nothing could be done. Among other reasons, this was an old artwork and its structure was too narrow to allow a wheelchair, even with a ramp. This is a body of work which utilised sense perception in an attempt to broader, broaden its viewership, but in doing so neglected to consider its further implications and the viewers it would isolate. As O'Connor notes, anyone who's ever looked at the outside of a kaleidoscope will know it somewhat misses the point. I've used this artwork as a key example because what is representative of the transition from viewership to activism has been made inaccessible but it wasn't the only inaccessible piece in the exhibition. The orb that was placed into the wall could only be reached from standing height, and how do we live together had to be stepped over to reach the other side of the room. By blocking this transition to activism and access to other works within the exhibition, a precedent has been set, which allowed disability to be treated as an isolated phenomenon and something that doesn't fit with the norm. A binary has been created between those who are able to experience the artwork and those who aren't. This is ableism within climate art. These artworks privilege the able-bodied, granting them exclusive access, 
not only to an understanding of the body of work as a homogenous whole, but also of the transition to activism. However, even if a ramp had been provided for O'Connor, issues remain. The visions of these artworks were clearly not designed for certain types of body, and the further implications of this will be examined. These objects and spaces are a distillation of the natural world into something that is small enough to fit in the gallery space. But within this natural is a very limited definition of body. I just want to take a moment here and give a background to queer theory for those who might not be familiar. The breadth of the term queer is reflected in what it covers. On a basic level, it's the questioning and destabilizing of gender, bodies, and sex across academic fields, opening up wider discussions of binaries within existing norms and values. In light of this, queer ecology applies these methods and strategies to nature and environmentalism. A key area that we'll be focusing on is a destabilization of what is seen as natural and unnatural. Views of this have, at various points in history, reduce sexual behaviors to just reproduction, thus labeling homosexuality or queerness as unnatural. Queer ecology dismantles the rigidity of binaries within sex and identity and calls for a rethinking of them within environmental politics and the arts. In this context, it's going to provide methods for the destabilization of ableism in climate art. By considering works that utilize sensorial immersion as, in essence, individual natures, we can hold them up to queer ecology and its methods in dismantling the binaries and subsequent exclusions that exist. Connections between queer theory and disability studies have been made before, often based on the fact that just as discrimination has allowed able-bodiedness to be seen as the default, with disability as an orbiting outlier, Heterosexuality is seen as the norm, with queerness existing as an alternative. In a TEDx talk in 2016 titled The Earth Is Not Your Mother, Alex Johnson accesses the negative effects on activism and attitudes towards sustainable living that the linguistic trope Mother Earth carries. It plays to the negatives of a gender binary that labels mothers as something vulnerable or something needing to be protected, and applies it to something that is non-human. Granted, this non-human object, Earth, is home to a wide array of species, but none except our own have evolved the same perception of gender that we have. Applying such a binary to an ecosystem achieves very little and risks excluding those who don't conform to it. The steps leading up to your spiral view created a similarly binary message. By interacting only with a limited definition of the human body, wheelchair users were excluded and labeled as belonging beyond the norm. Labeling the earth as mother sets a precedent for treating genders differently within climate activism. Inaccessible artworks set a precedent for treating people differently. To quote directly and circle back to our specific issue, we cannot afford any barrier that separates people from taking responsibility to manage the future and to shape it. Activism can rarely afford to cut corners with regards to limiting viewership. Central immersive artworks can dismantle the potential elitist barriers of prior knowledge, but that means nothing if they're replaced by barriers of physical inaccessibility. And what about the nature that exists beyond those barriers and within the artwork? In Heteronormativity Without Nature, Jonathan Gray criticizes a view of the natural. This view is one that doesn't include queerness, labeling it as unnatural. At the same time as there was a call for a return to nature for the health of the planet, there was the argument of heterosexuality being the only natural. Gray asked the question, how are queers to advocate for a nature that, according to heteronormativity, either does not include us, or we should rise above. Due to the universal scope of climate change, 
it's easy to rephrase this question. How can anyone advocate for a nature that doesn't include them? And why should they? Gray calls for a destabilization of this concept of nature. There is no reason that queer people should be excluded from acting against climate change, but a heteronormative narrative within environmentalism allowed them to be sidelined. And this is not a nature that should be being advocated for. Within the constructed natures of its spaces, in real life had the opportunity to encourage advocacy for a nature that accepts diversity. With the barrier of prior knowledge dismantled, the opportunity to spur people to activism, regardless of background or education was made available. Instead, yes, the distillation of phenomena to a sensual level collapsed space, creating arenas in which a simple personal relationship can be had with an environment, but that relationship is exclusive and its definition of a natural body is limited. These spaces are distilled individual natures in their own right, but the body it defines as being part of its constructed natural environment is both narrow and rigid. There is little or no room for movement of interpretation. Its understanding depends on their body being able to interact with it. Within the nature of Eliasson's spaces, it's disability that is deemed unnatural. The use of a wheelchair lies outside the space's definition of body, and wheelchair users are sidelined from its activism. This begs the question, why do norms of both heteronormativity and able-bodiedness retain such a hold on society and environmentalism? Both are highly constructed and idealized. Robert McCreer describes both as fetishized, products of historical processes that help secure both heterosexuality and able-bodiedness as the natural and the norm. The institutions in our culture that produce and secure a heterosexual identity also work to secure an able-bodied identity, literally constructing a world that always and everywhere privileges very narrow conceptions of ability. Climate art that relies on an able body fetishizes it. It associates able-bodiedness with the correct way to interact with an environment in a way that is neither reflective of the true diversities of human bodies or of a world that should be advocated for. In truth, there is no correct nor incorrect way to inhabit space. Neither sexuality nor the body are monolithic. These are, at best, are umbrella terms under which a vast diversity of bodies exist. A notion of a specific body being natural is a notion that must be destabilized. Queer ecology has illustrated problems with and methods to criticize the use of the gender binary. A similar tack must be taken to combat what is clearly ableism in climate art. McCrew identified the complex and historical processes helping to secure both heterosexual, heterosexual and able-bodied identities as the norm, which must be dismantled. But this must be done while still allowing immersive climate art to actually work. As climate art has developed over the past few years, various psychological studies have been conducted in an attempt to pin down what actually makes good climate art. A 2019 study at Art COP21 assess the cognitive responses of audience members to a series of climate-based artworks assigned to different headings. The conclusion was that the most engaging artwork for the audience was the group that presented the awesome solution, or beautiful and colorful depictions of sublime nature and solutions to environmental problems. The study measures good on the intentions towards real action of the viewers after experiencing the artwork in other words, artwork that help may make positive changes in real life. Immersive and sensory artworks achieve this well, relying on the captivating nature of the senses to inspire awe. So how can this translate into the world of activism? Controversy aside, in real life presented viewers with immersive experiences and ways to combat the climate crisis in real life. Not all of the artworks that were included were inaccessible, but it's the inclusion of some that prevent the exhibition being understood as a homogenous whole. 
The works are immersive and politically activated, but inaccessibility damages their effectiveness. The intention of this paper is not to critique only the works of Oliver Eliasson, but any that utilize immersion at the expense of inaccessibility. Opening up the conversations that will allow methods of activism to be constructively challenged will help build awareness of these issues. In this case, I've used queer ecology to illustrate the dangers of constructing an environment that is dependent on binaries, but also to demonstrate a path of destabilization that climate art can benefit from. Destabilization requires a widened definition of body. Progressions in technology have allowed for immersive art to expand beyond something very much tied to the physical. Video and projection can provide an immersive sensory experience and virtual reality can construct spaces to be navigated without the viewer having to move. Artworks utilizing these techniques have already found a place within activism. The wear of the dandelions by complex movements encourages advocacy for social justice through multimedia storytelling. Interestingly enough, Eliasson has been using lockdown to develop EarthSpeaker, which launches next week, and is an augmented reality app aimed at helping children to personify their environment. Truly destabilizing ableism within climate art requires more than just a turn towards something like virtual reality. It also requires a rejection of artworks that define the body in such a way. If an exhibition claims activist status, and a broadened viewership, it cannot interact only with a select group of people. Even if a move away from this occurs, ongoing and open conversations about activist artworks, accessibility must be had in order to ensure that they remain accessible regardless of medium. Just to end with a timely note, the world that we're currently locked down in well illustrates the violence of systematic discrimination that exists within our societies. Whether it's those who are more exposed to coronavirus or those who suffer at the hands of racist police brutality or those who will be disproportionately affected by climate change, the times that we're living in are no great equaliser. Now more than ever, climate art needs to take responsibility and actively fight the inclusion of all bodies. The destabilisation illustrated by queer ecology can provide a pathway to this, but accessibility within activism will need to remain an ongoing conversation and one that requires cooperation of both institution and individual. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lucy. The paper is concerned with forms of open subjectivity and how considerations of atmosphere have affected modes of engagement. In particular, I seek to establish the manner in which an open subjectivity has featured in recent discourses concerning both ecological participation or modes of being in the world and practices of participation in contemporary art. Here I explore a celebrated atmospheric artwork, Olafur Eliasson's The Weather Project, which is both an emblem of institutionalised installation art and has been conceived as developing an ecological awareness. I argue that there are three distinct approaches to interpreting the atmosphere and accompanying open subjectivity of The Weather Project. The first, taking into account the site of the work, concerns The Weather Project's public address, and the manner in which it refigures ideas of participatory art. The second, following the theme of the Weather Project, concerns an ecological address and the comparative appearance of open subjectivity in recent ecological thinking. The third and final use of atmosphere concerns the commercial enterprise of the Weather Project and is a demonstration of the ease with which open subjectivity can be co-opted to commercial ends. Therefore, after an introduction to the Weather Project, this paper is structured into three sections which consider each of these approaches. I conclude by exploring the frictions produced by these three readings, which sit uncomfortably together. I have by no means found an answer to the question of open subjectivity in the Weather Project. Rather, I hope that by spending time separating the manners in which it functions, I can reclaim a critical interest in the work and can illuminate the benefits and shortcomings of the cross-pollination between ecological and artistic approaches to participation, engagement and subjectivity. Now iconic, the Weather Project was a large-scale installation created for Tate Modern's Turbine Hall. Appearing as a giant sun suspended in the hall, 
It blazed throughout the grey London winter of 2003-04, its light attracting a record-breaking two million visitors over its six-month run. The work was the fourth instalment in the Unilever-sponsored Turbine Hall series, an annual commission for a unique artwork to engage with the vast post-industrial space. Described as a covered street, Tate are keen to try to establish the Turbine Hall as a public space, despite its reliance upon corporate sponsorship. The works in the series all demonstrate some engagement with contemporary theories on the formation or maintenance of a public. Encouraged by architecture which facilitates surveillance, observation is a constant theme across the series. The weather project radically altered the architecture of the Turbine Hall, creating an alternative artificial atmosphere. There were three essential elements to Eliasson's installation, light, mist and mirrors. 200 bulbs were arranged on a semicircular frame, which was attached high up to the back wall of the turbine hall. In front of them was placed a screen to diffuse their glow. These were monofrequency lights, the type generally used in street lamps. They emit light at such a narrow frequency that colours other than yellow and black are invisible. The straight top edge of the semicircle of lamps abutted the mirrors which Eliasson had installed across the entirety of the turbine hall ceiling, thus creating the effect of a full circle of orangish light, akin to a setting sun. The mirrors, visually doubling the volume of the hall, reflected everything in it, including visitors. Looking up, they could identify themselves or surreptitiously watch their fellow visitors. The reflected glow was complemented by the mist machines Eliasson also installed around the hall, which released a vapour of sugar water that slowly gathered and dissipated in the manner of clouds. The mist not only added to the impression of a hazy sunset, but changed the quality of air in the hall, deadening sound, blurring reflections and going some way to soften the dominating industrial walls. As you can see, this is a contemporary view of the turbine hall. The windows and skylights of the Turbine Hall had been sealed to prohibit the actual weather in London from altering the light levels inside the gallery. Although there was a gradation to light intensity, the glow filled the entire hall, so visitors were communally bathed in light as soon as they entered. Because the mirrors reflected everything, museum paraphernalia, such as signage and donation boxes, had to be removed from the Turbine Hall, further alienating the space from its everyday function. The only place to observe the hall without being reflected were the observation boxes on each level of the boiler house gallery. In the hall, the reflections were clear enough to pick out individuals, although because of the two-tone colours, this identification of self or other was often assisted by bodily movement, waving, running, twirling, holding hands to create reflected patterns or spell out words. Although there was no temperature control, the yellow glow encour encouraged visitors to linger, often sitting on the floor, appearing to bask under the sun. One critic describes the scene as like a crowd on an artificial beach. According to Tate, minimal control was exerted by security. People came in to eat their lunch, they fell asleep, had picnics with friends, opened bottles of champagne, did yoga. The front of house manager only remembers having to intervene once, to disrupt an overly amorous couple. Although the light, mist and mirrors created a compellingly immersive atmosphere, there was no concealment in the mechanics of its production. Standing at the back wall of the turbine hall, visitors could look up and clearly see the lamps and their wiring. Similarly, the reverse structure of the mirrors was visible from the top floor of the museum. The mist machines, mostly located around the bridge area, were out of reach but obvious and unhid unhidden. Revealing the construction of his illusions, or what he calls the mediation, was an important part of Eliasson's statements about the weather project. It is a technique he regularly employs in his work, to counter what he sees as the domination of a visual perception. In making obvious the constructions, Eliasson hopes to make apparent the hidden operations, physical and metaphorical, which structure acts of viewing, promoting an increased self-awareness. As such, he intends to create what he calls a looped participation, or participation where there is an evaluation of itself as participation. Such reflexivity is no novel idea in contemporary art. My particular concern here, however, is with Eliasson's simultaneous endeavour to foster looped participation and simulate a meteorological atmosphere. 
Installing the mirrored ceiling alone into the turbine hall would have also encouraged a looped participation in the viewing of your own and others' bodies in action. But the creation of the artificial atmosphere turns our attention to the environment. As such, Eliasson's invocation of the weather is of particular significance to his concept of participation. Atmosphere, a nebulous term in itself, is a holding environment, but is also used to describe the sense of a place. It is both external to and also affected by the subject. As such, an atmosphere is an in-between phenomenon, and attention to atmospheres can allow the refiguration of a subjective identification. In this way, Eliasson's use of an atmosphere encourages an open subjectivity, where, in a levelling of the subject-centred hierarchy, the interaction of subject and surroundings is reappraised. As curator and writer Daniel Birnbaum summarised, the weather project complicates whether you begins and ends. As mentioned in the introduction, the atmosphere of the weather project and the open subjectivity it encourages can be understood in three separate contexts. The first concerns the idea of participation as it has developed in contemporary art as a practice centred within specifically social structures. Ignited by Guy Debord's critique of the society of the spectacle, ideas of engagement tend to have relied on a realisation of the subject, an activation of either body or mind or both. More recently, the concept of the activated viewer has expanded into ideas of an activated and engaged community. Mi Won Kwon has done much to resituate the notion of sight in terms of community, but it is a redefinition which still maintains a subject-centred hierarchy, prioritising relationships between subjects without account of the environment that sustains them. In light of such descriptions of participation, the weather project is markedly different. On the one hand, it displays many aspects which are assertively spectacular, the scale, dominance and unchangeability of the work, let alone the manner in which people are transfixed by it. On the other hand, whatever participation occurs within the work builds no lasting community, not only because of the fleeting nature of the visitors, but because the there is little interaction encouraged between visitors, which is not based on observation. Against these forms of participation, open subjectivity encourages a here and nowness, which, although undoubtedly bringing forth a new set of problems, can offer a radical chance to inject environmental influence into social relations. The construction of a public in the weather project is affected by its atmosphere as well as its visitors. Although the elemental materials and sublime scales might link the weather project to a romantic tradition, the encouraged open subjectivity opposes the enlightenment view of human subjects as distinct from and in a relationship of domination over the environment. The second concern of open subjectivity in the weather project is as an ecological address. As we are all too aware, the atmosphere is crucial to e the ecological structure of the earth. But, as asserted by German philosopher Gerno Böhme, atmospheric thinking can also be a tool for a mode of ecological thinking. At the time, Eliasson's concern was perhaps more institutional than ecological, but in his later career he has certainly strengthened his ecological emphasis and the weather project has been, to some degree, refigured in this regard. This slide shows two pertinent examples of that refigured ecological address. On the left, you can see an image from Icewatch, an installation which left glacial ice blocks to melt outside of Tate Modern in December 2018. And on the right is a screenshot from last summer, when the Tate declared a climate emergency and used an image from the weather project to illustrate that press release. The weather project did not engage in ecological activism. Indeed, there are multiple issues around its site, sponsorship and scale that would make any such reading hard to countenance. But attention to atmospheres and the affordance of, of an open subjectivity have increasingly appeared in ecological thought since 2003-04. The diversion away from a self-centred subject mirrors approaches which advocate an anti-anthropocene manner of being in the world. The ecological philosopher Timothy Morton aptly describes the recent attention to atmosphere and its effects on subjectivity in his 2010 book, The Ecological Thought. In his words, quote, we can no longer have that reassuringly trivial conversation about the weather with someone in the street as a way to break the ice or pass the time. The conversation either trails off into a disturbingly meaningful silence, or someone mentions global warming. 
the weather no longer exists as a neutral seeming background against which events take place, end quote. In other words, what was previously refigured as a setting for acts of communication, a backdrop before which communities were built, has muscled its way to the fore, becoming, or needing to become, a factor in how we participate socially. The weather project appears as a pre-existing representation of such a shift in attention. In the ecological thought, Morton uses the idea of a mesh to describe new atmospheric relations, a radical openness where a subject is connected to a range of other beings and things as part of various expansive life systems. Ideas of the mesh of connection have become apparent in anti-Anthropocene writings by Donna Haraway, Anna Singh and Jill Bennett, to name just a few. In comparison to their real-life examples, the artificiality of the atmosphere of the weather project is of note. The fake sun with its sugary clouds, warm glow that holds no heat, and inability to ever set, can be read as a vision of unnatural nature, of man-made culture. The atmosphere in the turbine hall intentionally excluded, exclu excluded existing ecological atmospheres. Although the weather project's atmosphere might suggest an understanding of social participation which includes environmental relations, these are still socially constructed environments. The third operation of the relationship between atmosphere and open subjectivity in the weather project concerns its commercial interest. An open subjectivity is one that is always about to be made. It has continual possibility. In the contemporary attention economy, therefore, the continual possibility afforded by an open subjectivity can also be co-opted as a continual time of productivity. As apparent from the manner in which visitors behaved while in the weather project, the pleasant atmosphere encouraged people to be rather than just see. Leisure activities were brought into and commingled with the atmosphere of the space, producing cultural value in a manner not dissimilar to Maurizio Lazzarazzo's notion of immat immaterial labour. The placid behaviour of visitors seems in direct opposition to the image of the blazing sun, which should be too big and too close for comfort. But it is this imageability which has continued post-installation to find huge commercial circulation. Alongside the value of spending time and spending attention is actual spending. It is no coincidence that Tate Modern Cafe and Gift Shop open onto the turbine hall, allowing the atmosphere to permeate into each space. As you can see at the bottom of this slide, that light um, in the bottom left hand corner is from the gift shop. In a similar manner, attention to atmospheres has been of considerable interest to recent designs of commercial spaces such as shopping malls and airports, where the meshing of foreground, foreground and background is used to, su to seduce a subject to capitalist ends. The three operations I have described create certain frictions in the weather project. In each reading, the balance of the relationship between atmosphere and open subjectivity has a different emphasis. But in my opinion, these shifting balances do not destabilise the potential of an ecological open subjectivity, nor render an attention to atmosphere unworthwhile. Rather, like Donna Haraway's call to stay with the trouble, closer attention to the manipulations of atmosphere can prove productive. Ecological modes of being in the world, which place the subject in a mesh of connection, would do well to be aware of the value capitalism places on controlling the attention of its subjects. To conclude, I suggest the ecological potential of the weather project was the opportunity to reflect on ideas of what participation means. Because of the difficulties arising from its multiple readings, the atmosphere of the weather project remained an in-between phenomenon, never being allowed to fully settle into a single comment on arti artistic ecological or commercial practices. As such, the atmosphere created a tension which kept subjective identities open, calling critical attention to the relationship between subjectivity and atmosphere. Thanks so much, Grace, for um, uh, supplying a pre-recording of your presentation and being uh, so uh, helpful in getting that set up so that we could continue to hear what you had to say. Um, could I invite uh, Grace and Lucy to um, unmute and uh, to turn their videos on so that we could have some questions? Um, we have a large number of them, uh, so I will try and get through as many as possible in the 11 minutes that we have. <laughs> um, but I think um, quite 
I think because you both were talking about the same artist, I think there's scope for um, maybe for some of you, to, both of you to respond to each, uh, perhaps. Um, so the first one I wanted to go to was from Anna, um, which was to Lucy, but it, I think could be thought, uh, you, Grace, could uh, think about this as well. Um, I wondered about Eliasson being a bit ambivalent about the environment anyway. For example, his installation at Tate, The Weather Project, used a tremendous amount of energy. In, he in a talk, he said, enough for a small town, although you'd have to check the veracity of that. Also, um, in an early work, it was responsible for dyeing Six Rivers Green. He used a non-toxic dye, but the cloudy effect would certainly have had a likely detrimental effect, impact on the ecology. So I think that question about ambivalence um, is a good place to, uh, to start. Yeah, um, I'm sure Grace can also input to this, having done kind of, I think, more extensive research on the weather project. But I think a question like that really pivots on whether it's the attention that Eliasson brought to the um, climate issue through works like this that outweigh the possible environmental detriment um, negatives in that. So I think it's a question of whether the attention brought to it was more worthy than the possible harm and whether it's possible to create such immersive and I think works that can um, impact this many people without having some impact on the environment. So it's a kind of moral <laughs> question about that and which one's worth more. Yeah, I think Lucy, you're com completely right that um, Eliasson uh, banks all of his ecological approach on um, grabbing the attentions of um, his audience. Um, and I think a really good example of perhaps when this starts to fall apart is his Ice Watch series, um, which um, was in one of my slides with the ice, glacial ice melting outside the Tate. Um, and that's actually the third time that he's harvest, harvested glacial ice, which sort of brings up that question of when the shock value starts to become an actual problem. Great, thanks. Uh, there's a, um, a couple of questions for Lucy, which I'm going to roll into one. Uh, so there was uh, one uh, uh, from the Democratic Society. How does mental health fit into queer theory and to queer ecology? And then maybe we could think about that um, in relation uh, as alongside another question, which is from Christiane. I was especially struck by your questioning of the heteronormativity and able-bodiedness of concepts of nature. I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about the queering of nature and how we can best combat the heteronormative and able-bodied notions of nature, especially because they've been so powerful historically. So mental health and nature and how they fit into your work. So I think to begin with mental health, whilst that's not an area that I've particularly focused on, it definitely does come under, especially queer theory. Um, and an example of this could be using queer theory to destabilize the kind of structure that exists over mental health and mental health treatment in terms of recognizing the different needs of LGBT or queer people um, rather than kind of forcing this heteronormative narrative of ignoring the issues in kind of discrimination within society that might affect um, queer people. And in terms of combating I just find that question. Yeah, combating these notions. Um, I think it's, it relies very much on an ongoing conversation um, that, amongst other things, really requires a recognition of these ingrained and needless uses. Um, I spoke about the gender binary. And so there are many things that could be done. I think recognition is particularly important. And with relation to my presentation, it's about recognizing the kind of impacts of these applications of binaries beyond um, queer people or wheelchair users 
in that it will negatively negatively affect the activism beyond that by isolating these communities um so isolating those people that could be uh contributing to your activism thank you thank you so much so we've run out of time for this panel i'm so i know that there are other questions which we didn't have time to get through um but please do join me in giving grace and lucy a uh, massive thanks and virtual round of applause uh, for two excellent papers <laughs> um, and we'll be back for the afternoon session which will start at 3 30 uh, british summer time so that's in 35 minutes um, thank you so much everyone for coming so far and i hope we can continue these conversations in uh, the later afternoon session see you at 3 30. Good afternoon. I'm happy to be presenting at the Cortal Institute, at least virtually, at their Symposium on Sustainable Art Practices during the time of climate change. My name is Lisa Reindorf. I'm an architect and an artist focusing on climate change, in particular rising seas and sinking cities. I'm not an art historian, as many of you are, but I'm also an educator and a writer on art and environment. This presentation will focus on some ideas about sustainable art and show some examples by well-known artists as well as some lesser known artists. It's a very broad topic, so we'll be zigzagging between different art history eras and artists and talking about the ideas of sustainable art. Conscientious artists are concerned with environmental and global issues as are many of the other members of the art world, such as the curators, historians, dealers, gallerists, and collectors, etc. Indeed, much of contemporary art deals with issues like these very topics of environment and global issues. But how can art practice reconcile with environmental aims? That is what we're going to be focusing on. But what are we talking about when we say sustainable art? A simple definition of sustainable art for the purposes of this presentation is as follows. Artworks are defined as sustainable if they're made through processes that are not using up resources and do no damage to the environment or produce products that are detrimental. These art creations and the ways they are made are often examine environmental degradation and the results of climate change. So let's start with the art market process, because that's actually key to understanding the issues that are confrontable, confronting sustainable art. Generally, as you all know, art moves through a market in which art is bought and sold, such as art fairs, museums, galleries, etc. It requires a work of art and a buyer and often an intermediary agent. While these art objects are often beautiful and often meaningful and provide an income, this business model consumes resources and puts more material into the world. So it's kind of a quandary. Sustainable art entails examining or upending this traditional model on how art enters the world and coming up with some new ideas of what constitutes an art product, how the art product is produced, and how it is presented to the world. So we'll start with some basic ideas of art that's sustainable in its production. And that is the use of natural materials. Making art from nature involves utilizing various elements such as leaves, sticks, stones, bones, water, etc., in a creative way to make a new art object. And the resulting artwork often makes a statement about nature and humanity's relationship to nature. Here, Brazilian artist Enrique Oliere plays with massive tree trunks. He using abandoned pieces of wood that he gathered and recycled from 
both the countryside and urban areas in Brazil. He twists raw materials into site-specific installations. Alviera creates organic forms that swirl around religious rigid poles <laughs> or creep up walls effortlessly, projecting the illusion that nature and construction are intertwined. And here's another artist who uses natural materials, in this case, feathers. Artist Chris Maynard combines biology and ecology into his artworks, and they are made from feathers that are ethically sourced from private aviaries and zoos. He uses only those that are shed or discarded by birds that are naturally recycled into his art. And we can also produce sustainable art materials that are biodegradable. I experimented with some of this myself, working with an artist who dyes fabric that are biodegradable materials, actually biodegradable dyes. So we experimented with creating paints distilled from indigo, curry, blackberries, cayenne, turmeric, kind of everything in the kitchen sink, and chlorophyll, all sorts of plant-based materials and spices. And then I use seaweed to thicken it. Now it actually worked quite well in the artwork, but the problem is that being biodegradable, it would disintegrate. So it's an ephemeral piece of art. Another approach is art that's recyclable or reconfigurable. Korean artist Seo Kyun is an example of an international artist whose work is at an intersection between art, social science, and ecological engineering. Here is his installation Supernatural at Boston's Museum of Fine Arts. And it's made from recyclable green-colored plastic products that are recycled to create a green landscape. Another example of gathering and reusing materials is this enormous piece, Plastic Bags, by Cameroon artist Pascal Martin Tayou. I think this installation is quite stunning. It's at the Museum of Contemporary Art of Rome, and it's made of nothing but recycled plastic bags and stands nearly 10 meters tall. Now, these recycled materials can also be reused. An example of this is artist Vanessa Enriquez. I actually met her at International Fellowship that we were both on last year. She's born in Mexico and now lives and practices in Berlin. And she creates these three-dimensional drawings using recycled magnetic tape. Those of you might remember old VCR tape. That's what she uses. These geometric structures are meticulously assembled by her in an installation in an architectural setting, and then they're taken down and dismantled and repacked for reuse in another installation. Now there's another mode of sustainable art practices, and that's time-based art, such as video art, or art that's produced digitally. I'm sure you all know many contemporary practitioners. One that I show here is artist Tommy Hartung, based in New York City. He's an animator whose work employs homemade means and materials that he uses to create kind of science fiction docudrama and invented landscapes and imaginative narratives. They're quite stunning as well. And then here's another art type that's sustainable, which is art as performance, where the person and their actions is actually the art. The most well-known practitioner, of course, is Marina Abramovic. She's a Serbian artist known for her vanguard pieces that use her body both as subject and vehicle. Here she sits across from a participant. In this photo, it's her long-term partner. 
in the art performance, The Artist is Present, which was performed over several months at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And another sustainable art practice, well known, is land art. This is an approach that has been in practice for several decades and is exemplified by practitioners such as Andrew Goldsworthy. As most of you know, in the second half of the last century, artists began exploring conceptual ways of creating art with their environment. Part of the motivation for this was to work outside the confines of an increasingly commercialized art market and to make works that couldn't really be commodified as objects. And many of these artists were inspired by the growing ecology movement. So they used common materials such as wood, earth, sand and stones, and water. They created enormous artworks that were made without compromising the environment. The image here is the well-known spiral jetty by Robert Smithson. And an offshoot of modern land art is land art that has an actual ecological purpose. And Bavarian artist Niels Udo exemplifies this approach. He works directly with nature to create really stunning site-specific works of art that celebrate the beauty of the land. He uses found berries, leaves, branches, flower blossoms, and transforms them into really poetic and evocative pieces. His motto is to draw with flowers to paint with clouds, to write with water. Niels Udo says, by installing paintings or integrating them into more complex installations, now I said paintings, but he meant plantings, but they are actually kind of painting with plants. The work is literally implanted into nature. As a part of nature, the work lives and passes away in the rhythm of the seasons. So it kind of evolves over time as nature does. Now, here's a really interesting modern variation on land art, which is a combination of land art and activism, and also a commentary on climate change, which we're dealing with today. Artist Eve Moser is an American artist who lives and works in New York City and she's best known for her public art installation, High Waterline, which premiered in New York City in 2007. She maps thick blue chalk lines directly on to the streets, sidewalks, parks, the line of flood zones. Now she uses these government maps from NASA and satellite maps and sci scientific data to determine where the high water line will be as sea levels rise in various different urban areas. She's done this like in New York, Philadelphia, Miami. And people who saw her laying down the chalk in their neighborhoods would ask her or her workers what they were doing, and then conversations about climate change would follow. In the photo above, you can see flooding as a result of Hurricane Sandy in New York City, where the flood actually surpassed where she had written down and laid down the chalk marks. The image below shows Miami, which is simultaneously sinking and flooding. And she did a high tide water mark project there as well, marking where the flood zone would be. So this type of art combines science, data, community action, and results in a sustainable art practice, which is art as activism. Which brings me to another type of sustainable art, where artists use their platform as an advocate on issues such as gender, race, environment, and land use. And they do so by actions such as educating on climate change, performance on violence, performing gardens, and other types of activism. 
Here, Diana Kolekova is a Slovakian artist who's also an activist. She intervenes in urban settings to bring, urban settings that is, to bring attention to real estate and land use. One of her projects repurposed a large sign which she painted with alue to rent and rolled out in front of municipal buildings as a commentary on commercialization. And here, artist Ayana Evans makes a performance using her own body to help audience understand what black women often face. Her performances address issues of gender and race relations. Now we've seen a lot of examples of sustainable art practices, recyclable art, reconfigurable art, land art, performance art, and art as activism. But if an artist affects a temporary creation or performance piece, is there an art product that can be monetized? And if not, how would the artist and the venue support themselves from their artwork? And here is the big challenge of truly sustainable art. And here are some ideas on how we can address that challenge. Art educates, it heals, it inspires, and it connects the communities that the artists serve. If we want to shift from art as predominantly commodity to one of ecological sustainability, then artists and venues need to be supported and a much greater investment in the arts is needed. So this could take the form of commissions, sponsorships, grants, and events, but at a much larger scale that we do currently. Here's an example, Water Fire. It's a public art event conceived by artist Barnaby Evans of Providence, Rhode Island. It takes place in urban waterways and involves music performances, ceremonial bonfires, boats, and rituals. It actually became a catalyst for revitalization of the entire urban waterfront. Events are now supported by grants and have multiple partnerships with social services, education, arts, and civic groups to help promote other causes. This is a great example of art that's funded but then gives back to the community. So this leads to some other ideas. What if instead of buying a large sculpture, a business sponsored an art happening? Or the public paid for an artist to view their art intervention? Or the government gave grants for artists to curate participatory experiences? And here's another example. Government grants to create art that benefits the environment. English artist Niels Norman creates an art garden that grows vegetables, and these Visionary gardens, inspired by the socio-ecological ideals of permaculture, are a system that promotes sustainable community-involved agricultural design. Improving the environment while simultaneously creating a work of art. What a great idea. An example is Marina Debris, who I suspect is a nom de plume. Her work is literally rubbish, she uses upcycled trash in her art to raise awareness of ocean and beach pollution. She's also a fundraiser for environmental organizations, and she receives grants and is paid for conference appearances and educational activities. So the government or other organizations can provide grants to artists to curate participatory experiences such as a happening. Here is a happening in Berlin. An example of a country that really supports this type of art is Germany. They provide a huge amount of grants to support art organizations and artists. They provide rent subsidies, commissions, insurance, etc. In conclusion, we've seen a lot of ideas of sustainable art practices, recyclable art, reconfigurable art, use of ecological materials, performance art, land art, time-based art, art as activism. These are all valuable ideas. But I think that we've learned that the salient means to achieve truly sustainable art 
is to provide a much greater investment in the arts. For truly sustainable art, there needs to be a shift from art as predominantly marketplace commodity to practice of art as a public benefit and ecological sustainability. Thank you for listening, and I hope I provided you with some ideas to think about sustainable art. We'll now take some questions and be open for discussion. Guwen B. born 1973, a Yolongu artist of Northeast Arnhem Land in Australia, is one of the most innovative contemporary artists to come out of the region in recent years. Yolongu is the term his people use to describe those indigenous to Northeast Arnhem Land. Ganabar takes innovation in Yolongu art to its fullest expression by incorporating mining industry detritus as found objects in his art. My goal in this presentation is to describe the deeper meanings of Ganabar's artistic practice in relation to the Yolongu metaphysical concept of time, which I argue is intrinsic to his work and offers an indigenous environmental perspective on country. In this talk, I'll explore three of Ganabar's artworks that use found industrial objects as raw material to demonstrate how he merges deep Yolongu cultural knowledge with his distinctly contemporary context. Ganabar combines ancestral designs and industrial materials to create a conversation between form and content that establishes space for contemplation of a vast expanse of time. My aim is to show how Ganembar's art engages these ancestral concepts of time to provide a commentary on contemporary land rights and caring for the environment, known in Aboriginal parlance as caring for country with a capital C. Ganembar lives and works in his mother's homeland of Gangan, a very remote area that is a four-hour drive from the nearest Aboriginal art center in Yurikala. As of 2020, there are only 10 houses in Gangan, and yet it is home to six Aboriginal artists who have each won a major Aboriginal art prize. There, he learned from the elders, nothing less than in his words, the foundations of the deep identity of the world. From his youth, Ganambar's interest in the foundations of Yalangu law and his cool disposition put him on course to acquire an unusual set of skills. He was sought out by elders to resolve inter-clan conflicts. He became an intercultural figure by traveling widely as a skilled ceremonial player of the yudaki, a wind instrument also known as a didgeridoo. He uses power tools such as the jigsaw and dremel in his visual art, fabrication skills he developed by building houses on remote Aboriginal homelands. The artist's personal experiences combined with his innovative creative impulses drove him to push Yolongu contemporary art in a new direction. He is a cross-cultural figure, pushing cultural boundaries while remaining faithful to Aboriginal roots. As a cultural authority, Ganabar evaluates each innovation in terms of its faithfulness to Yolongu traditions, which are based on the actions of ancestral beings that travel the land during the origin period known as the Dreaming, or Wangar, the times of the first morning. He uncovers new layers of meaning to maintain relevance for Yolongu clans and descendants. Global recognition and appreciation for his art attests to the efficacy of his project to communicate Yolongu concerns to an international audience. His success might surprise those who hold Aboriginal art to standards of cultural purity that would not be applied to other contemporary art practices. Change is reluctantly accepted by some outsiders who tend to fetishize a restrictive definition of authentic Aboriginal expression requiring all natural materials. As a non Yolongu person, I am relying on information gathered by anthropo anthropologists and art center workers to provide insights to aspects of culture that inform his work, especially the conception of time in which the past, present, and future are happening simultaneously. This concept leads to the incorporation of time as an identifiable component of the work. Time can be present in a work. Yolongu artists have stated that one of the main goals of their art is cross-cultural communication with cultural outsiders. Historically, Yolongu used their art as a means both to assert their ownership of the land 
and to express the land's ancestral significance, making their art integral to land rights litigation. In the 1960s, Yonggu autonomy was threatened by state-backed mining interests, prompting an urgent expression of ownership and connection to country. The 1963 Yerkala Bark Petition against that bauxite aluminum ore mine marked the start of the recent history of Aboriginal art used explicitly for communicating with non-Aboriginal groups. The two typewritten pages of the petition are glued to pieces of bark embellished with a border of clan designs, legitimizing the typewritten claims with features of their visual culture thousands of years old. Ganabar lived through a similar land rights battle started in 2008 that reclaimed the Blue Mud Bay tidal lands under indigenous ownership, based on ancestral culture as evidence. Fast forward to December 2017 and the opening of Golkulla Mining Company, the first Aboriginal-owned bauxite mine. The company trains and employs Aboriginal workers in sustainable practices for mining the richness of bauxite in the land, the presence of which is an ancestral gift. Environmental concerns might be relatable for non Yalangu, but environmentalism does not effectively summarize ancestral land stewardship. In Ganabar's art, ancestral designs inscribe contemporary objects, and therefore contemporary life, into a system of representation that asserts the pre-existing and continuous sovereignty of ancestral culture. His found object works illustrate how these industrial materials can be made to yield to a bigger picture, yielding to the caring for country with a capital C. In his practice, found objects lose their in industrial significance and are repositioned within an ancestral timeline. This use of industrial mining detritus pushes the elasticity of Yalangu culture and gives non Yalangu people an opportunity to contemplate a more expansive understanding of time. Since we relate to the universe through time, a change in perspective can revise mistaken beliefs about ownership of the land. Ganambar utilizes his skills with the electric Dremel to incise systems of diamond shaped patterns into metal in Boiku 2018. The designs have a variety of sources that reach back to ancestral times. The finely cross-hatched lines produce the shimmering optical effect known as biriyun that is required to adequately reflect the sacred ancestral energy of the subject. Ancestral designs recreated by the artist appear as a decorative motif, but are actually a manifestation of the source of ancestral power. The imagery represents the mixing of fresh water and salt water during the wet season of flooding and the ceremonies and patterns that accompany that occasion. The Boiku fish trap is a recurring theme for Ganambar, where he creates a visual representation of seasonal renewal. At the end, we'll look at another work by the same title. The Boiku motif is multivalent, signifying the physical trap, the trapping ceremony, and all the ancestors who previously performed the ceremony. The patterns are enclosed by larger meandering segments that recreate the surface of water during the flood. In talking about the work, Gallenbar describes the visual qualities of flood water, suggesting the formal content is derived as much from observations of nature as from classical Yalangu patterning. In this way, the conceptually radical all-over composition of Boiku 2018 is a naturalistic representation of colliding tides. Anthropologist Howard Morphy describes the spiritual and cultural imperative to reproduce ancestral designs as a fundamental element of cultural maintenance for the Yalangu. He also identifies the forms with natural phenomena, such as ripples on a water surface, as evidence of the continuous presence of ancestral beings. The repeated pattern dominates as an isolated visual element in the work, creating the shimmering presence of ancestral power through Biriyun. Without any other signposts to indicate the location or discern a narrative, the viewer is placed within a timeless moment that recurs each wet season. Ganabar repeats the diamond patterning to display an active conversation with the past and the ever-present ancestral power. 
This interaction of the ancestral, the observable, and the industrial reveals how metaphysical time guides the artistic reinvention crucial to Yolngu culture. Ganabar's ancestors are affiliated with the freshwater spirit, and he also gained ceremonial experience working for the saltwater clan. The combining of sacred freshwater of the river system with saltwater flows from the ocean is of major cultural significance and important for understanding fishing patterns and seasonal change. The high contrast system of clan patterns symbolically shows the blending of opposing groups that come together to fish for nourishing food. Ganambar makes this blending of clans the subject of the work on an epic scale, modeling a harmonious intercultural exchange. In Yalangu society, each clan has its own designs that encode ownership of specific tracts of ancestral land. The design acts as a title deed, operative in the distant past, present, and future. In order to understand the cultural climate in which these designs are open to interpretation, it may be helpful to first explore the first instance of their production by ancestors. Ancestral beings spent time on Earth that was explosively creative, yet finite, conceivable by human minds because of the linear structure of their stories that include trauma and death. The ancestral beings have relatable experiences. At times they grow weary or act hastily, granting a human quality to the first mark makers. The ancestral beings created features of the landscape while occupied with epic dramas and also mundane events like chasing a love interest or making a fire. They created designs by accident and mid-journey, suggesting no intrinsic mandate that the designs remain static. Designs were passed down to the first human ancestors and kept alive by recreating that first act of making and aligning contemporary artistic activity with ancestral creative actions. This quality of Aboriginal art communicates not only the transcultural power of Ganabar's practice, communicating between Yolngu and Western cultures, but also its transtemporal function, communicating between ancestral and contemporary moments. The practice of mimicry of the ancestral reveals the ancient roots of his process but also the sanctity of the artist's role in expressing the ancestral. Through insight into the observable and ancestral sources of his designs, we can glimpse the significance of reproducing designs as transcending the human scale of time and giving voice to ancestors and country in which industry overpowers indigenous lives. As found objects in their own right, Natural ochre pigments and bark have ancestral origins that inform their use in ceremony and art. Ganambar has determined that industrial objects found on the land satisfy the Yolngu mandate that you must paint the land with materials from the land. Rather than expressing a rejection or slackening of Yolngu law, this innovation is a more expansive interpretation reflecting the reality of a changed landscape in the context of a continuous ancestral presence. In Ganambar's sculpture Dangulchi 2010, he applies clan designs in natural pigments to a lightweight industrial plastic pipe known as polyvinyl chloride, or PVC. The work is conceived as a memorial sculpture that is an idiom in Yolngu art practices. It is in the form of a larikich, a coffin for the bones of the deceased, historically made from a termite hollowed log. Ganambar removes sections from the PVC pipe so that negative space reveals the shape of a bird, thus altering the original function of the larikij as a container. In this gesture, he expands the visual vocabulary of larikij through the new structural possibilities afforded by PVC. The figure of the bird conveys the next phase of the cyclical path of the larikij form, the ossuary is meant to biodegrade back into the land as the completion of its ceremonial purpose. In this work, the container of death takes on the naturalistic form of a new life. Ganambar is preceded by generations of contemporary Arnhem Land artists, including his father-in-law, Jambawa Marawili, who trained him in visual production. In addition to pioneering new visual forms of expression in the 1990s, Marawili is also a political and social visionary 
responsible for organizing the community in the fight for the intertidal lands of Blue Mud Bay. Ganabar may also have learned from Marawili the role of art in expressing the will of the land. On this topic, Marawili states, the land has everything it needs, but it couldn't speak. It couldn't express itself, tell its identity. And so it grew a tongue. That is the Yolngu, that is me. We are the tongue of the land, grown by the land, so it can sing who it is. We exist so we can paint the land. That's our job, paint and sing and dance so it can feel good to express its true identity. Without us, it cannot talk, but it is still there, only silent. The various innovations that Ganabar has developed throughout his practice speak to this quality of Yongu artists as a mouthpiece for the land, and therefore a mouthpiece for ancestral culture and country. In Boiku 2011, Ganambar carves a piece of rubber conveyor belt from a mine near his studio. The rubber belt was used to take richness away from the community, but Ganambar returns that value by raising awareness about Yolngu identity. While the industrial materials lend certain aesthetic qualities to the work, Ganambar's choice of materials is not a purely formal exploration, nor is it an exclusively environmental commentary. The encroachment of outside values can overdetermine Ganambar's materials as a demonstration of environmental activism, when the reality is a more complex presentation of Aboriginal identity, time, and the continuous ancestral presence in country. Yongu found object art offers an alternative to the anthropocentric worldview. This work undermines the capitalocentric plan in which industry overpowers indigenous lives and redefines country as the original voice to be engaged, not exploited. Analysis of found object works is deepened by the Yongu continuous present concept of time. Ganabar's found objects amplify this concept so that the works operate in a unique temporal moment, helping non-Yolngu minds grapple with Yolngu simultaneity. Surely the concept of Biriyun and the artist's role of creating opportunities for the ancestral past to emanate through shimmering optical effects takes on a formidable quality when the ancestral past emanates for the first time through the surface of a PVC pipe. What most fascinates is that Ganambar's radical gestures are never a rejection of old ways, even in his most extreme innovations. The ancestral and naturalistic sources of imagery are incorporated, and his art, firmly set in the Yolngu cultural historical foundation, brings the formal content into a new era. He is moving between mediums, separating and recombining materials, exploring their interactions and the formal possibilities they create. While doing this, a metaphysics of materials emerges in which time mediates ongoing changes in land use and ultimately reinscribes the land with indigenous sovereignty. Galambar's purpose is to uncover layers of meaning in Yolngu traditions, keeping them relevant to the next generations. His combination of ancient designs and industrial materials signals an expanse of time that dwarfs current power structures and shows the primacy of Yolngu culture in Yolngu art history. By pushing the boundaries of his art materials, Ganabar expands the possibilities of meaning production in Yolngu fabrication practices and authors a formal language for communicating Yolngu identity and concerns. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, I'd like to invite Lisa and Mary to come forward for about, uh, let me see, 12 minutes of Q&A. Um, so I'm gonna just start to pull from the audience questions and I'll start with a question for Lisa from Christiane. Um, you talked about digital art, such as Tommy Hartung's work as one of the sustainable art practices. I was wondering what you think about the impact of technology 
service centers in the desert, digital waste, the ecological impact of the internet, on ecology and sustainability. In what ways might digital art practices be or not be sustainable? Well, that is an excellent question. And I'll have to say right off, I don't have all the answers. This was a presentation that just highlighted some ideas. Um, digital art can be environmental. It also cannot be environmental if it uses up a lot of energy in producing and showing it. But it doesn't use a lot of natural resources and it can be replicated with, um, out using, without using a lot of materials. So in that sense, it is environmental. But your question leads to a really good point, which is that we have to consider all types of approaches in art in the time of climate change. And um, we had a really interesting discussion about uh, Elias and, and his work that even though it had a really strong environmental message, it might not have been environmental in itself. But I would argue that it has a really strong impact, you know, as powerful impact as Lorenzo Quinn's hand in the Venice Biennale, which also might not be considered an environmentally produced work. Um, but my presentation was focusing on ways that individual artists and venues can just start thinking about these issues and whether their practice really is a sustainable one. I'll leave Thank it there. Thank you, Lisa. I'm going to move now to a question from Mary, from Dennis. So, Mary, you read Ganambar's over very much in the way I would imagine he would present it to his audience or the way a gallery would present it to clients. Could it not be read equally as an art market fetishization of the ancestral and an exploitation of Aboriginal art traditions? That's an interesting question. Um, you know, I, I think that one of the ways that you can be certain it's not an exploitation is that it's the artist's decision to create works for sale. Um, so one of the things I tried to describe in the presentation is that there's a historical precedent for art purely as a form of communication with outsiders. So when you look at a work by Gwynby Ganambar, you're seeing, a, you're seeing a piece of culture that has been packaged for outsiders. Um, you know, the inside version might be in the form of body painting or something that is actually restricted and would not be visible to an outside audience. So it's a, it's a unique idiom. It's an idiomatic form that is an indigenous, uh, that's a, you know, a truly indigenous art form that has been created for outside consumption. Um, so in a way, I, I consider it an, a sort of an achievement that the work is, um, you know, creating art that can be commodified by the art, by the art market. That, that to me seems like a, an adoption of a new language that is, uh, that is effective in communicating Yolngu concerns to, uh, to a, a much, much wider audience. That's how I learned about it, for instance. Great, thank you. I'm gonna now move to a question for Lisa, which is from one of our speakers tomorrow, Laura. And uh, Laura says, thank you, Lisa, very interesting presentation. You define sustainable art by referring to the concept of damage. How do you define damage? How do I define damage? Um, I think different people would define it differently, but for purposes of sustainable art and the issues that I was looking at, I would define it as art that doesn't utilize a lot of natural materials, doesn't destroy them. Um, so for instance, in some of the artwork, they didn't cut down trees to make uh, an installation. They found objects that already had fallen. Um, and then the other aspect of doing no harm would be not producing something that is toxic um, or um, environmentally uh, harmful. Using that word harmful, but not um, 
producing something that, that does damage. So um, again, the two things, not using resources and not producing something that hurts the environment. Mm. Yes, indeed. Um, I, there's, I think this is quite an interesting time to bring in the question from Anna, which mm -hmm. is a, which I think for both people could, uh, both Mary and Lisa could have, I'd be interested to know your thoughts on this, which is um, about the historic differences in how public funding is targeted and, the, um, and especially between the context we were looking at between the UK, North America and Australia. And how does the condition of public funding um, and how does that, how does the state of public funding and its allocation um, condition what the work the artists make? That also, I'll just answer that and maybe Mary can address the Australia part of it. Uh, really interesting question and quite um, germane to how we can fund sustainable art. Um, I was at an art fellowship uh, this past year with, uh, for a month with eight other international artists. And one of the things we discussed it, we discussed was art funding. And um, I use the example of Germany because they fund artists to a huge degree in all sorts of ways. You know, they pay their rent, they commission prod projects. Um, the US has drastically under this horrible administration, uh, we didn't have a huge amount of support for the arts to begin with, but the National Endowment for the Arts, which is the main art funding source was really cut. Um, so a lot of the art that is produced is under, especially large scale art, is under the domain of corporate sponsorships and that really skewers the message. So um, that's why my point is, if you want to have sustainable art and art that's environmental and educates on the environment, you have to invest into it and it can come around and you know, create value as well. Mary, maybe you can talk about Australia. Um, yeah, I guess in terms of funding in Australia, that's definitely, that's the subject of a future project for me, for sure. <laughs> um, I, in, um, I, I don't, so I can't speak to the specifics right now of, of uh, say government or corporate sponsorship, but um, what I, what I would say is that the art center model, which I touch on a little bit, just the access to art centers, which have, uh, you know, you know, they have these, you know, wonderful online marketplaces for buying indigenous art direct, you know, as, as directly as possible from the artist. So for instance, um, actually my dress is from a Barbara Designs in, Mil mm -hmm. uh, in Meningrida, Australia, which is just a few hours away from where Ganambar is uh, practicing his work. Um, so purchasing art directly from art centers is sort of the most, the most ethical way of supporting these projects. Um, they do get some state funding, of course, um, but, I, but I'm not familiar with the specifics of that. Um, but it does, you know, it, it, create, it gives access to materials. Of course, with Ganambar, his access to materials has so much to do with the way that industry is affecting his environment. So he's, he's getting so many of his art materials from the land, from, you know, what's left over from mining projects. Um, so in terms of funding, that's a little bit of a gray area, considering that it's that it's starting with found found objects. But I like that question, though. Uh, well, maybe that's a good place to wrap up this panel. Thank you both so much for such brilliant papers. Thank Round you. Applause here, um, and we'll now take a seven-minute break. <laughs>